squeeze a little hoops in amongst all of this football talk on a Monday. Jazz in Milwaukee tonight. It might actually be nicer in Milwaukee than it is here in Salt Lake City today. Snow falling here in downtown Salt Lake City. Britton Johnson with us here. Britt, how are you, man? I'm doing good, Dale. How are you? Good. What did you think of that football game for uh, Saturday night? Oh, my goodness. Fun. Hey, those are, the, those are easy to watch. I was more gut-wrenched and upset over Oregon. I'm not going to lie, it was so frustrating that I didn't even watch the first quarter of the, the Utah football game, and my wife was getting mad at me uh, and, and my daughter yelling at me, why aren't we watching the youth game? And I was trying to explain to them the importance of Oregon winning. I've never found myself cheering for the Oregon Ducks so hard in my life, Bill. It was actually it was sort of like an out-of-body experience, kind of strange for me. Uh, say it with me, though, Britton. Utah's path is still there. Utah's path is still there. <laughs> Utah's path is still there. That yes. didn't feel horrible. That felt okay. Yeah, it's 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 there. They, they they again they've got to win this week and then go beat Oregon again. But I still think the resume, as long as Georgia loses to LSU, which is not a given, is still there. So we'll see. Yeah, you know, what? I mean, I I felt kind of in my stomach for Oregon fans the way I did that night against USC, watching their defensive backs just get burned. And I know I know ours didn't really get burned versus USC, but it was just those two, three, you know, deep ball plays that you wish you could have back. You would have defended it differently. You probably would have shaded the safety over more. But um, theirs probably hurt worse, right? It it looked like uh, Arizona State's receivers were just completely open and sort of I don't know if it was just a bad judgment on one on one call or what, but it was. Uh, uh, that was tough, man. But I agree with you. I still think Utah can control their own destiny, and and they'll have a path. They just crush these next two games. All right, we're going to talk some hoops in a minute. But I wanted to talk to you about something that happened recently in the sports world that you have a pretty good feel for. And I wanted to see how it all kind of settled out before we chatted about it. A couple of okay. week, about a week and a half ago, uh, there was that big brouhaha on that Thursday night between the uh, the Steelers and the Browns. Yeah. And, you know, it all came down, it all shook out, and then about uh, five days, I think it was last Wednesday or Thursday, uh, Miles Garrett came out and, and accused Mason Rudolph of calling him a racial slur. Sure. And I, I immediately thought of you because you went through a very similar situation some 21 years ago. Uh, we didn't have social media then, we barely had the internet then, but you were accused by a, an opponent of calling that opponent a racial slur in a very big setting in the Final Four. And you were branded by a lot of people something because I think we automatically assume in our society that whoever accuses the other person of that is is right and correct, especially when that person happens to be black and the other person happens to be white. So walk us back to that time. I know you've talked about it a lot through your life and your career, but I think it's now topical because the NFL came out and said there was there was nothing to it. It didn't happen. Yeah. Nobody on the field heard it, and it seemed like a last-ditch attempt for Miles Garrett to try and save some face instead of owning up to it. Walk us through what happened with you and how that was handled back then and uh, just kind of refresh our listeners that may have been too young or didn't know about it at the time. Well, first of all, I think this this situation with, with Garrett um, is has been ugly, and my story, has, you know, has actually turned out to be quite an amazing story and, and a pretty awesome one that I'm able to tell people and sort of I think, um, you know, build some inspiration into people's hearts when when things can turn out the right way when when people uh, figure out the right way to go about, uh, you know forgetting and forgiving and forgetting. But uh, my, my story basically was uh, us playing versus North Carolina. I had to go out and guard a player that was the offensive leading, one of the offensive leading rebounders in the ACC. I came in as a freshman and, I, and my coach told me if that certain player was to get an offensive rebound against me, he'd pull me out of the game. So I used all 200 pounds of my skinny, you know, pesky frame to annoy the crap out of this guy. Well, he kind of got sick of me and we had a bunch of words back and forth. Um, and, but at one point he slammed me down on the ground and they called it off. They called a foul on him and I jumped up and had a bunch of words for him. And we were walking down the court kind of side by side, shoulder by shoulder. And he just, I think got sick and tired of me and he sort of spit on my cheek. He didn't, you know, hawk back a, a full on Logie, but he sort of blew into my face, some spit. I got frustrated and upset about it. Went to the bench. Some of the coaches saw it. 
we end up winning the game after the game. One of my biggest regrets is just not moving forward and not saying anything because I had reporters asking me, well, what happened between you and – and his name's Mac Tarjai. I'll say his name because it's all – you know, you can Google it and find out. So they asked Mac Tar why uh, we were ha- – no, they asked me what happened. I said, well, go ask him. He's the one that spit in my face. And I had just wished at that point, you know, just to not make this a whole brouhaha that I would have never said anything. Well, they did go ask him. They went over to his locker room and asked him why he did that. And he told everyone I used the N-word. Um, I found out about all this, Bill. We celebrated that night, like, you know, as, as fun as that Final Four was, we yep. celebrated big time but then got ready for Kentucky. But Sunday morning, my phone rings in my hotel room, and it's my dad who's down in San Antonio, and he says, if you turned on your TV – and I turned it on, and I'm there's my face on Sports Center being accused of calling this player a racial slur. And I just remember feeling absolutely sick to my stomach. Um, I got called up to Coach Majerus' hotel room. He chewed me out, told me he was going to send me home, told me I'm a freshman and this isn't about you. And I kept telling him over and over, Coach, I didn't say it. And he goes, Are you sure? And I, I had to break down into tears and say, Coach, I said a lot of things to that player, but I didn't say that. I didn't call him that. And coach said, all right, let's go. Takes me to a a press conference at the Alamo Dome in front of a national stage and has me tell my side of the story. Then he gets up, backs me up. The greatest thing about this story, Bill, is that, you know, this player, Maktar, had already told everybody that I'd used that slur. And then he retracted his statement. Sunday morning, um, in an interview with USA Today, he retracted it and told everybody I didn't say it. And the story didn't get a lot of, (laughs) <laughs> news and publicity but a camera followed me around in the lineups at the national championship game and and uh can't remember who was on the play during it but they cleared up the story said that Maktar retracted it and so you know for me that was the biggest blessing ever and for 20 years you know people always ask me do you hate that guy for calling accusing you of this and that and I said listen we all make mistakes I mean he says in his article with USA Today he had newspaper guys you know reporters fly into his locker room and start asking him why you spit on that, you know, freshman white kid from Utah. And and he said he panicked. He panicked. He knew he spit on me. So he panicked and told him a made up story. Well, what's cool about the whole story is, you know, just last year in the jazz arena, I ran into Mac Tarjai for the first time uh, in 20 years and I approached him and he and I had an incredible 20 minute conversation and a fan actually in the arena caught a picture of it. And Maktar and I now email each other when he comes in town, he lets me know. And, you know, if I want to go grab a drink with him or go get a, a bite to eat. And uh, we've ended up forming kind of a real cool relationship. So I was nervous as ever to go approach him, but I'm glad I did. And we kind of broke through the ice and I said to him, do you remember me? And he goes, how could I forget you? And then we had a great conversation. He apologized to me. We, it was water under the bridge. And then he later emailed me and told me how grateful he was that we were able to do that. So my story ended up having a pretty awesome ending. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with this, this Steelers NFL, you know, um, the, the Steelers. And I'm trying to think who it was against the Browns. Uh, story. The Browns. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think their stories. I hope that their story can have a good ending as well. So it, it took 20 years. I, I, that, I wanted to ask you if he had ever reached out in, in the interim, even a, a note or an email or, or approached he you. He did. So, he sent me a note right after the Final okay. Four. He wrote gotcha. me a letter of apology. And um, for me, and we almost crossed paths. We almost crossed paths in the D League, and we almost hmm. crossed paths over in Europe. We were both playing in the French League. And when I played his team, he was sick and wasn't in the game. But, um, you know, I was nervous to cross paths with him because he had a history of, of getting in fights and, uh, you know, being a pretty grumpy player, and I didn't know what it was going to turn into because I know he and I didn't get along real well in that Final Four game, but um, as this picture kind of shows that I'll, I'll one day maybe post and tell a little bit more detail in the story, it, it's just awesome that he and I have been able to look and say, look, man, we both were young. We both made stupid mistakes because I, I was. I was probably the most annoying freshman on the planet he had to guard in that game, but I was doing it with a 380 pound coach behind me that was ready to kill me if I didn't keep that guy off the offensive boards. So uh, it, there was reason for my peskiness and probably reason behind him accusing me of some, well, not good reason, but we both learned from it and moved on. And now it's kind of turned into a, a really uh, a beautiful relationship. 
Uh, we're talking to Britton Johnson. That is an unbelievable story, by the way, and I'm glad you shared it with us. Uh, share another story with me. Your coach went into the Bass College Basketball Hall of Fame last night. Sad, yeah. Sadly, he wasn't around to, to see it or witness it or be part of it. But if Rick would have been with us last night and would have been able to be in Kansas City for that event, uh, do you think it would have meant something to him to go into that Hall of Fame? Absolutely. Listen, the guy, uh, his entire life was basketball, right? Where some coaches have a little bit better balance with a wife, with kids, with family of some sort. His entire life was basketball, and so I think it would have meant everything to him um, to be able to be honored with that. And I've been very, you know, transparent about my thoughts of Coach Majerus. I tell a lot of funny stories. I tell the stories of how, you know, his um, unbalanced life sort of spilled over to us in practices and a lot of, I think, maybe anger slash depression that he was dealing with was just absolutely um, thrown onto us young 18, 19, 20 year olds who didn't really know what to think of all of that. But at the end of the day, you know, he was a brilliant mind. He was a brilliant basketball mind. He knew how to take average players and sprinkled with a few really good players and your Andre Millers and Keith Van Horns and, and teach them how to play together, teach them how to play the right way. You know, is as brutal as Majerus was to us sometimes and sometimes media members and other people, he never wanted to embarrass his opponents. He always won with dignity and lost with dignity. You know, he was the guy that taught me, uh, you know, you dribble the ball out when you're up and you don't embarrass your teammates. You don't hang on the rim. If you get a dunk, you don't embarrass your teammates. Made me go apologize to uh, uh San Diego state's coach uh, when I hung on the rim too long at a dunk. So, he, he did his part in teaching us how to be uh, good winners, good losers, good men at times. But there was also times where, man, he was uh, one of the most difficult human beings that I've experienced in my lifetime to be around. So with a mix of all that, I, I am very grateful that he made it into the Hall of Fame. I, I think he deserved it. We won a lot of games. He brought a lot of pride to University of Utah basketball. And... Um, so, yeah, I, I think that no doubt he deserved it, and he would have very much enjoyed uh, being put in. Simply on the basketball side of things, personal stuff aside, you played in a lot of places for a lot of different people in your basketball career from junior jazz all the way through your pro career. Rick was pro- I'm going to guess Rick was probably the greatest coach you ever played for because he's he's in the Hall of Fame. But Doc is up there, too. You played a little bit with Doc, but – when you just talk about basketball and Rick Majerus, of all the things, you don't go into the Hall of Fame because you were good at one thing. Of all the things that he did as a basketball coach, what what was the essence of Rick's greatness, Britton? I think getting you to walk on the court and 100% feel accountability towards the team. You know, you, you went on the court, and if, if Alex Jensen's guy beat him and I missed my spot to help him out, like slide over and play help defense, he, he ingrained that into your bones. As a freshman, you felt it the most because you, you were learning how to do it and you were making mistake after mistake. But then as a sophomore, junior, and senior, you were expected to be the guy to teach that accountability to the, to the younger guys. And in all my playing days – uh, and, and I had some awesome teammates in high school as well. We went to two state championships, um, and I played for some good teams in the pros. But, if, but his, my experience with him, I've never felt uh, more accountable to my team, and I've never felt more protected by my team, if that makes sense. While they were yelling at you at one minute, they were taking care of you the next minute. And that was special. And being on that Final Four team was special because I got to get that feeling with four other NBA players, where when I got back from my, my, my church mission, um, I played with great players like Chris Burgess, uh, Nick Jacobson, Trace Caden, my brother Jeff, Travis Spivey. But, it, you know, we all, we're all very, um, you know, we're not stupid. We know that we weren't the type of team that that Final Four team was. So, you know, you, you had to learn how to be a team player with the great players and then learn how to be a team player with – you know, teams that maybe underachieved a little bit and didn't do as great. But he created that, and that's been something that I've been able to use in the rest of my life. I mean, I've been able to use that in business um, situations. I've been able to use that in speaking to, to kids at schools, speaking to corporations, and then also, I mean, a little bit in my family life. I'm not going to say that I would treat my wife and kids the way I treat my teammates, but I understand that, you know, uh, 
in order for, for the ship to, to row correctly the right way, you know, everybody's got to be digging in together on both sides of it. And so he, uh, he was good at that, at, at teaching you how to forget who you are and, and, and adopt a team concept. All right, before I let you go, uh, Jazz and Bucks tonight uh, on paper, pretty good matchup. Looks like both teams are healthy and should be ready to go. What do you make of not only the matchup tonight, but where the Jazz are right now? Yeah, I believe Chris Middleton might be out for Milwaukee, and there's a chance Rudy Gobert would be out. But I think that this will be a great – Jazz have an incredible test going up, coming up, right? They're playing uh, they're playing the one, two, five, and 6 seeds on the East, as I'm looking at it right now, on, on the uh, Eastern Con- Conference standing. So for the Jazz, this road trip uh, and for this, this coaching staff, I think we're really going to be able to see where this team is at because the last two games where the Jazz – played awesome with their numbers. Donovan Mitchell looked like an all-star. You're talking about two bottom-of-the-barrel Golden State and New Orleans Pelicans who are terrible at defense right now teams. So this next this next, and the timing of this road trip is great, Bill, because with Quinn and this staff, they'll be able to take this road trip, whether it's horrendous, whether it's kind of good or great, and, and, and analyze it and use it to, to just make some, I think, decis- to start opening up doors of making decisions towards the end of the season, right? You, you Justin Zanuck probably has to analyze the crap out of this one and say, okay, here's where we need help. Um, this is what areas I've got to start to tap into as far as players and agents and figuring out where we build. But I think this, this East Coast road trip and the timing of it couldn't be more perfect for the Jazz because it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell all of us a lot. 